I'm very happy to be here with all of you who I can't see, but um, <laughs> very, very nice to be uh, beaming, beaming in. Scotty, oh. literally, from the Highlands of Scotland. Yeah, well, I'm, from, I'm from Newcastle, just on the borders, Hadrian's Wall country, so I know Scotland very well, and the Highlands is, is a beautiful area of the world. So uh, I was brought up on the other side of Hadrian's Wall, in the borders. In the, do, in the, in the borders of England, do they call it the border country? Because we, yeah. the Scots side, we call it the border country. Yeah, so Kelso sort of way, yeah, so that, yeah. yeah. Oh, excellent. Well, I'll probably end up start chatting about the, the, the North, North of England, Scotland bit later. But, but no, just to welcome everyone. Um, obviously, this is a, a webinar with uh, Oscar Award winning Tilda Swinton and, and hosted by myself, uh, uh, Rob Virgil for the National Youth Film Academy. Uh, now, we're delighted to, to welcome you um, to this session and you have very kindly offered your time for free um, to sort of inspire our young members, um, all age 16 to 25, to sort of make their own career in, in, in film. Um, I know you don't need an introduction, um, but obviously you started your career at Cambridge University, where I understand you did a lot of uh, uh, sort of theatre performance in there, and uh, then went into the Royal Shakespeare Company, where you performed in numerous plays over the years, uh, and then obviously went into sort of mainstream uh, projects uh, for film, including Vanilla Sky, The Chronicles of Narnia, which is one of my uh, favourite books of all time when I was uh, growing up as a child, and, and obviously you uh, won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress in your role for uh, in Michael Clayton. Um, and we've also got our amazing National Youth Film Academy members uh, who are all aged 16 to 25 and like yourself are all sort of driven uh, to have a career in film and start their own uh, career uh, sort of journey. Um, and, and obviously we're very fortunate to have you today. And, uh, and just for those guys who've not done the webinars before, uh, the way it's going to work is uh, we'll be asking Tilda uh, some questions for about half an hour, uh, just about um, her journey, how uh, she got into the, the industry. And then you guys have given us some questions as well, which we can then uh, pass over to, to be answered. Um, so there we go. I suppose, that is, so I suppose, should we start then, Tilda? Should we yes. get on? Brilliant. Um, just, yeah, go on. Go for it. No, have you got a question? No, Sorry. just to say, I mean, you'll probably address this, but it's kind of interesting hearing yourself introduced. Uh, yeah. Because, um, and you will all appreciate this in 100 years when this is happening to you, uh, it's very interesting what people choose to, and this isn't a criticism at all, but it's very interesting the things, the things that rise to the top or the things that rise to the sort of understanding about you that aren't necessarily, I won't say that they're not true, but they're not necessarily the most important things. So that's one of the things that it's quite great for us to address here. Um, for example, the idea that I have a career at all is really strange for me. I'm not aware of having a career, of having, or ever having wanted to have a career. I always wanted to have a life. And mm -hmm. I think there's a real difference. And there's a real difference. If someone had told me when I was your age that it was okay to just want a really interesting life, and not to have to have a career, I would have really been grateful. So I'm just passing that to you as my first gift. Um, a good life is the most important thing and work will come out of that. So I just wanted to say that because that's the first thing you said and I thought, that's interesting. The idea that I started my so-called career when I was at university, I wasn't thinking about a career when I was at university. I was thinking about having a great time with friends, which of course is the most important thing. So anyway, I just wanted to say that. I'm really glad you've said that actually, Tilda, because I know um, you, you've done num no, uh, well loads of interviews before, and a lot of people obviously ask you the standard questions about what role, how, what brought you to this role, how do you develop a character. But, but what I really want to do, and what I love about the National Youth Film Academy, is we're trying to help um, our young members sort of enter into something they love, they love doing. Yes. And I, I want to find out about your journey and how you you, yeah. you got here and your life, yeah. and because yeah. different stories by different people as well, and. Uh, and, and before we start by talking about your acting roles, I'm, I'm actually really interested in how you even got into acting because your journey yeah. is quite an interesting one. You were, you were born in London. Your father obviously was a very well-known and respected general of the British Armed, Armed Forces. Um, your mother was from Australia and you, I, I believe that you, you attended a boarding school growing up as well. Um, what, what was it like growing up and how did you even start to fall in love with, uh, with performing and, and, and acting? Well, I mean, I don't know how anybody can really describe their childhood because you only have one. So uh, it was great. It was my childhood and my family, oh, my beloved family. And I can't imagine anything else. I mean, I can fantasize about other upbringings, but uh, it was it was great. Um, the, the thing that 
we had to contend with our family. We were, uh, uh, my father was, as you say, in the military, so we traveled a lot. And that thing of, you know, I think my parents celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary, and at the same time, they celebrated their 21st move, which is a bit of a nightmare as a child because you're always coming, you know, going to another house, going to another school, making friends with a whole new group of people. So I would say, that that's maybe the first emblematic thing for me was the need to constantly remake my circle. And I don't know if that made a performer of me. I still don't really feel like a proper performer, but it, it did make me a filmmaker because that's what filmmaking is, by the way. It doesn't matter whether you're working in props or whether you're working in locations or whether you're a performer or whether you're a director or a writer. This thing of making a camp of comrades and um, having this objective and fulfilling it in the trenches, if you like, and and that thing of, and then it, it moving on and you make another group of friends two years later, or maybe even for some, what I call proper professional actors or professionals, they, they work every, all the time. So they may be three months time, they're doing the same thing again. They're making a whole new family and they're making these intimate, trusting relationships with a whole bunch of strangers. That is something that I think my childhood was good for um, <laughs> in terms of preparing me to be a filmmaker, for sure. Um, and that, yeah, that was, that was one good thing. Even the horror of going to boarding school, which I don't recommend to anybody. Um, yeah, I suppose if there's one thing to be optimistic about, it did, you know, it means that you know how to, how to be resourceful and how to make friends. Uh, so that's the first step in being an artist is how to make friends, I would say. I'm really glad you said that because we, uh, I'll, I'll sort of touch on it uh, later on, but a lot of um, our young actors and filmmakers, when they when they come onto our, our courses or they ask for advice, they always think they've been given the impression that this industry is about backstabbing and doing one over on each other. And when I've, I've been so fortunate to speak to people such as yourself who have sort of reached the huge pinnacles of their career, and I've not met people of your status who are, who are bad people. They seem to be people who like to get on with each other. Is that your experience as well? You've, you've found? Yes. I mean, th th there are so many myths that ab abound. Now, either I work and live in such a particular corner of, of filmmaking that I've just never met it, mm -hmm. or it's a complete load of rubbish. But the idea, for example, that it's important to be incredibly egotistic or it's important to be self, very self-contained. I find completely the opposite of my experience. My experience is about comradeship and about uh, having a laugh, frankly, <laughs> having as much of a laugh as you possibly can, which means being with people who you feel very safe with, very compatible with, and you share the same fantasies about why don't we try this? Or do you like the idea of this film? Or should we, should we have, go on this adventure together? It's a little bit like choosing who you wanna go on holiday with. Now, mm -hmm. there will be lots of what I call proper professionals who will say that they don't know what I'm talking about and that it's all incredibly hardened and it's all about you know, building an independent identity. And they may be right for their Oh, oh, it says unmuted. I have unmuted. I am unmuted. And I can't hear you, Rob. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> back, back. So we were just talking about okay. having fun. <laughs> yeah, having fun. And, and this goes back, I will say, back to your, you know, I mean, I, you guys that I'm talking to now who I can't see, um, I, believe it or not, someone of my great age, I can remember very, very clearly what it is to be 15, 25 or whatever it is. I can remember it very clearly. Partly I have children who are 21 now and I they're sort of beginning to make their gestures of, you know, an independent life. And I can remember it very, very clearly. Um, 
And I'm very grateful that for whatever reason, I decided to pitch myself at having fun, finding people I feel safe with, going on adventures with people and not, you know, I mean, I was never ambitious ever, except to have a home by the sea with a kitchen garden and some children and some dogs. I'm serious. That's what I, that was my ambition, very ambitious. And by the way, here we are and the sea's just outside there. And um, the dogs are behind this screen and the children are on their way. Um, the, I think if you have an ambition to, you know, be phenomenally rich and famous, then I don't know what I can really say to you that will help because I never had that ambition and I, and I'm very grateful that I didn't have that ambition. I didn't have that itch to scratch. Um, but given that I really enjoyed making work with friends when I was at university, I suppose you're right when you say that I started my so-called career at university because what I learned at university was, uh, what fun it is to do things with friends. And so that, and that never changed. I left university, I made work with friends and then on it goes, on it goes the same now, exactly the same. I've been working for 30 years and, and that's all I ever do is work with my pals. Um, so you're right, it started then, but I'm very glad that I figured out nice and early that that was important to me and that I actually wasn't interested in being famous or rich and, uh, and to, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful. But if you, if, and there's no judgment, if you do want to be famous and rich, then maybe you need to talk to somebody else because they may have some very interesting advice about how to, uh, how to track that, that line. I think uh, we, we talked actually, uh, we talked quite a lot openly and actually so kind of about being successful and successful isn't about being famous and rich. It's, it's sort of waking up in the morning with purpose and, and being yes. passionate. Yes. Uh, being respected by your peers and uh, and that's what we try that's the ethos that, that we feel that people should follow but I am intrigued though because you went to university to study political science was that yeah. correct and uh, I mean how did you did you lots, watch a lot of theatre when you were younger with your family or what what got you into theatre how did you no, fall not theatre no I mean what got me in interestingly enough I went to university uh, I, I got into university, I went to Cambridge University and I was accepted as a poet. I was a I was always a writer and I had what they uh, what they call an exhibition, which is a sort of semi scholarship to be a poet. And that was all, you know, and, and when you get an exhibition for something, it's a little bit like being a getting a sports scholarship. You know, you kind of owe them. They give you the place, but you've kind of got to do the thing. And I arrived and I stopped writing instantly. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I just felt overwhelmed by too much pressure and I just stopped. And they, they made me read too much. And I was just, you know, just, it was overbearing. So I wasn't writing, but I did meet friends who were very into plays. And at that time I was super into film always, not into theater ever, still not. Nice. No. <laughs> is, that why, is that why you left the Royal Shakespeare Company? Was it? Well, was it? I went to the Royal Shakespeare. I'll tell you, I'll just track it through. So, so I started, I met all these people who I liked, my friends, and they happened to be a group who were really in, into plays and mm -hmm. doing theater. And some of them, I mean, very serious and went on to be professional theater directors and professional theater performers and professional theater designers. And, and I kind of fell in with them and they said, come and be in some plays. And so I was in some plays, but it was very unambitious, very mm -hmm. uncareery, very totally about me just hanging out with my pals. And I did that all the time I was at university. And I didn't know what I, I was going to do when I left university. I kind of wanted to go back to writing. I, but I just slipped into continuing to doing plays, but this time professionally. I got my equity card at a rep theater which I really loved. And I just, then I went to the Royal Shakespeare Company. Now, the interesting thing about the Royal Shakespeare Company and ambition is that a lot of actors, what I call proper actors, they want to, particularly theater actors, they, their idea of heaven is to be accepted into the Royal Shakespeare Company and they're going to be there for the rest of their lives. I'm really glad I went there nice and early because I got it completely out of my system. I realized A, that I didn't want to be a professional actor and B, that I didn't want to be what I would call an industrial actor or an industrial artist because it was just too big and 
it, I always said rather rudely, I said it was a little bit like joining ICI. It was a big monolithic uh, corporation and I didn't feel very free and it was fine, but it wasn't my happiest year of my life. So I got that out of my system and I realized I didn't want to be a, prof a professional actor. But then I was a bit high and dry because I was beginning to realize I didn't really want to work in theater either. And it was at that point that um, I met Derek Jarman, who was the first filmmaker that I worked with. And I started making movies. And from that point on, I have made films and I've never worked in the theater again. Um, it was just as life always is. It's just sort of, you know, you put one foot in front of the other and you, you know, you have this little job and then you go this little job and then you find what you really want to do. And it took me not that long, like a couple of years after le leaving university to, to discover making films and that was it that was truly my love and did you ever when you entered Cambridge University as a poet did you ever think that you'd be a an Oscar award winning <laughs> actor I still I still no. don't quite that's the other thing when you mention that I'm like what <laughs> no, no no absolutely not it's all a sort of magical mystery tour and odd things happen on the way but we all people, have that yes <laughs> And it because because a lot of people obviously we were it's interesting because I, I know you don't describe it as a career but obviously you've um, you're very fortunate to to have the the home life that you've you, you've always wanted based on uh, on your well ex, ex, extremely <laughs> extreme talent to be to be fair did you 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 must have, did you find any barriers to to uh, to the industry when you when you got into it as, as a young person or was there or was it um, was your journey relatively easy? Um, getting back to well, that? there's two. I mean, first of all, you're completely right, Rob. I am incredibly lucky. But I think, as I say, the reason I'm lucky, the main luck was figuring out quite early on in my life what mattered to me. Mm. And what mattered to me was this thing of working collectively. And that has seen me through. That's the ship that is carrying me across all these waters all the way into my, you know, in aged years. It's a really, it's just a good thing to figure out what you want. And it just so happens that, and I don't quite know why, but I, I, I hit upon this wisdom, one piece of wisdom that I had when I was in my early twenties. I just knew that was very important to me. And I just went wherever that was. Mm -hmm. And nobody, you know, I also was lucky. I didn't have any kind of professional advisors saying to me, oh, don't work with Derek Jarman. That won't be very good for your career. Or, you know, don't do that piece of experimental theater in Germany. That won't be very good for your career. I didn't have a career to protect. I just yeah. had a life. And I had people I worked with, my agents, were just super cool people who understood me and knew that I wasn't going to, they couldn't mold me. You know, they couldn't, go, oh yeah, we think she would make a good new what's it, and then they could put me down that route. So I was very, that was also very lucky. I, I was supported. I wasn't alone in that. I had people who were able to, uh, you know, I never made, I mean, you know, I've only become solvent very recently in my life, you know, not having any money for a long time was not a problem. That's the other thing. It, it just wasn't a problem. I didn't have children till I was quite late, old. I was 36 when I had my children. So I could squat, I could <laughs> share flats with people and not earn anything for years. And that was handy because if I had needed to earn money, more money, then I would have had to make all sorts of completely rational compromises. And maybe I wouldn't have been as happy, but you know, we do what we what we can to to to, to fund our lives. Um, yeah. What did you ask me? You asked me a question that I'm not answering. I realise. Uh, to be honest, I've just got so in. Got I've yeah, got okay. so. But it is interesting when you talk about because a lot of our young actors and filmmakers they think there's so much pressure now to to make money as quickly as you possibly. Sure. And uh, and you do see them sort of deviate from their their dream to be be a, yeah. a successful yeah. person. Whether it's oh, I, know, I know what I was going to say. Sorry to interrupt you, but I've just remembered what I was going to say, which is really important, is that what I'm talking about, my beginnings, when I was your age, all of you, that's a, such a long time ago. <laughs> and things were so different then. But so that we don't get depressed and think that I'm completely redundant in talking to you, 
I think some things are still the same. So these are the things that were different. Okay. Um, when I started wanting to make films, and you are, as I understand it, you're filmmakers. You don't want to work in the theater or anything particularly, but you know, you're, we're talking filmmaking here. When I was, we're talk, my first film, 1985, if you can imagine back that far, might as well be 1485. And the whole, world of filmmaking in the UK and I was based in England. I went to school in England in Cambridge and then after I left university I just went to live in London like people do because I I come from the country in Scotland and there wasn't going to be much filmmaking there so I just went to went to live in London and at that time the filmmaking well there are a number of things that were really different and I know this is going to be a stretch for you to understand this or to believe me but first of all there wasn't really a film industry. Secondly, there was a fantastic national television. Yeah. There was no digital media. There was no social media. There were four channels. And the most industrial work, like really great quality uh, filmmaking in a way, was being done by the BBC. Like mm -hmm. amazing BBC series. It's kind of coming back a bit now, but that was really what the industry in this country, in that country, England, because I'm in Scotland now, that's really was focused, I think, on television. And if you wanted to be a, a kind of industrial actor or director, that's really where you pitched yourself. Because this is what was going on in the cinema. There were these huge people like Alan Parker, people you won't have heard of, but Alan Parker and, and, and David Lean, like megalithic, amazing international filmmakers who happened to be English, but they were working in an international world. So that felt completely out of our reach. And then there was television. And then there was this other corner, which was what now would be probably described as art cinema which was called independent cinema, but this is before, believe it or not, this is like a history lesson, this is before independent cinema, this is before Sundance, this is before it became commodified, this is before film four, it's before film four, you know, so there was this arty little world which was mainly funded by the BFI, which is still a wonderful organization that I'm very closely associated with, and they took people like Derek Jarman, Peter Greenaway, Sally Potter. If you don't know these filmmakers, really, it's an education to look for, look at this work. And they said to them, OK, we're going to give you a tiny bit of money, something like 200,000 pounds to make a film. But we're here for the next five films. So just we want you to develop your voice. Now, the first filmmaker that I worked with was one of these, Derek Jarman. And he I'm not going to go into a huge Derek Jarman lecture because you should go and look for Derek Jarman. And that's another time for that. Um, but he was one of these art filmmakers who made very low budget films, experimental films a lot of the time, and worked with a very tight group of people. And I became one of this group of people. So we worked on a film a year for, I worked with him for nine years until he died of AIDS in 1994. And that was my apprenticeship. And that was a particular world. Now, funnily enough, if we'd been talking 10 years ago, I would have said to you, that doesn't exist anymore. And that's sad for burgeoning young film artists like you, but actually it's changing. And I think it's quite encouraging now that you have a lot of opportunities that we didn't have then. For example, you can make films yourselves on your phones and you mm -hmm. can upload them to YouTube and you can practice and you can develop your voice yourselves. That was not, uh, possible for us. Um, and of course, the BFI does still exist. Things, there was a sticky period through the 90s and the noughties when you couldn't really make a film, you couldn't get a budget to make a film unless you were able to convince somebody that it was going to make money, which is no way to make art. You, you know, if you if someone starts trying getting you to prove, you know, these forms that you fill out saying, this is, this is how I can prove that my film will make a profit, forget it. So independence, proper independence with a little, not codependence, like not associated to some studio. Yeah. I mean, real independence is, is now again available to you, all of us. And that's a very good thing. But that was, that was why it was different then. Now, what you're facing 
I, I don't really know. I'm with my own kids. I'm beginning to realize that it's such a different landscape. Um, I, I don't know what obstacles you're facing or you're preparing to face. Um, but I do think that there are things that that sort of tracks that I made that I followed and that I made that are still valid, like stick with your friends. Yeah. make work independently don't give it away and don't expect to make any money don't expect to make any money for a long time maybe get a job you know there used to be a thing when i was a kid people used to say don't get a job because if you get a job then it'll just deflect it from your work i i don't agree i think it can really shore you up and make you safe so that it yeah. keeps your art pure and you can really develop that script with your friends that you've been trying to figure out and you can film it on your phone and you can, you know, put it into a doc fest or whatever. Um, and you're able to eat uh, because you're working in a cafe. I, I think that's a completely reasonable and sensible way to go. Definitely. I mean, you keep on talking about uh, networking friends and this is what we, yeah. this is why we bring actors and filmmakers together because quite often actors sit there and think, well, I don't know, I don't know anyone who can make a film. And likewise, filmmakers are always looking for actors. And, and I've noticed throughout your career, you're always um, you, you're very humble with um, the way that you you sort of made it and, 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 and sort of saying thank you to your friend. I mean, even when you won the, the Oscar, you, you, you dedicated that to your, to your agent. I mean, how, how important is it? I gave it, it to my agent. Oh, you actually gave it to her? Yeah, I don't have it. <laughs> Why did you do that then? And why, why, why is it important to have good people around you? But it's accurate, Rob. It's not, it's not an affectation. It's just the truth. And, and some of you I'm talking to already have made films and some of you haven't. But even the second you do, you're going to see the truth of what I'm saying. Nobody does it by themselves. It's a complete and, and particularly actors. There's this sort of, you know, pinnacle of the iceberg feeling and they get all this praise and it's rubbish. You know, they're just they're just standing on the top of this pyramid of hundreds, very often thousands of people underneath. And uh, it's just accurate. That's just the way it is. And that's the glory of it. It's not a solo enterprise. Um, and I think I don't know. I think if anybody is drawn, I imagine all of you, one of the reasons that you're drawn to making films is to work with people. Uh, if if we wanted to work alone, we'd I don't know we'd be writers or we'd be um, solo musicians. Even solo musicians work with thousands of people. So, you know, I mean, there are some people. There's a wonderful experimental filmmaker called Peter Gadal, who is again you should look at look him up. Uh, who works entirely alone. I mean, he I think there's not a I mean there are lots of filmmakers, art filmmakers who work entirely alone, but they are in a minority if we're talking industry and i think we are talking industry in this conversation um you're talking collective uh, mm -hmm. and anybody who anybody who doesn't say that i think is bullshitting honestly i think it's not it's just they they know that's not true mm -hmm. um, i'll tell you something i want to pass something on that i was the beneficiary of and i'm literally going to repeat it uh, to you i remember um years ago we're going to the Edinburgh Film Festival and uh, when I just started working with Derek Jarman and there were a number of uh, like luminaries, like big producers talking from a stage about making films uh, and, and, and there were people in your position listening and, and I was one of them. And of course, there's film students and there's, uh, you know, young filmmakers wanting to hear the pearls of wisdom from these, you know, experienced professionals. Uh, such as you might think I am right now. I Okay, I'll put my hand up. I've been working for a long time. I still don't believe I'm a professional, but I do have this experience to pass on to you. And there were, Alan Parker was one of the speakers who's a big industrial filmmaker, um, in, particularly in the 80s and, and, and 90s. And David Putnam, who was a huge producer um, uh, who did things like Chariots of Fire, big industrial films. And those first two people, and I'm totally naming and shaming them because I thought it was, you know, not helpful. They both basically said to the audience, myself included, listen, filmmaking is an incredibly complicated and expensive business. And to make a film, you need millions of pounds. And you need to really leave this to the professionals. 
And I remember we all went out for a coffee break and we were all like, mm, okay, <laughs> okay. People sort of thinking, oh, maybe I will take that job in my uncle's butcher after all, you know this. And then Derek Jarman spoke after the break and he said what I'm saying to you now, he said, it is so easy. You just get that, in those days, he was saying, get that video camera. Now I'm saying to you, take your phone, yeah. get your friends together and make it. Whatever that little script in the bottom of your drawer is, get it out, make it, do it. In those days, uh, Derek Jarman was experimenting with Super 8 film, which you may or may not know is, you know, the old style movie cameras, silent, grainy, beautiful. And we made two feature films with Super 8 cam with a Super 8 camera. And we had no budget. We just made it like a home movie over the course of a year. And then eventually it was the first one, The Last of England, which is a great classic, was distributed across the world and it is now considered a masterpiece. And the second one, The Garden, also made with this little home movie camera. And the people, myself included, who came out of his talk were completely lit up. Everybody was going, hey, you know, why don't, your, your father's got an old um, Super 8 camera. You, your uncle's got an old video camera. Why don't we, next, what are you doing next weekend? Should we do it? And it was so empowering. And I just want to literally, word for word, pass that on to you now. It's even easier for you now to make films. Don't leave it to the professionals, for mm. God's sake, because the professionals cannot be trusted. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it belongs to you. It belongs to us to make this work. Don't wait for anybody's permission and just do it. And it's, it's brilliant advice. And, that, and the ethos is just going out and making a story. And the yeah. story, and that's what it is. I mean, if you, and a lot of people, in fact, I will ask you the question. A lot of actors or young filmmakers say, oh, I shouldn't work for free or I, I shouldn't be doing this. But I mean, I don't know if you agree with this. I'm sort of, I, I think if you're all doing it together and it's, yeah. it's practical, and it's fun. There's nothing wrong with going out, just going and making a story and doing it for fun. I completely agree. The only thing I would say is that there comes a point in your life mm -hmm. when you, you know that you need to be paid. And it may be quite late in your life. I mean, I was very late in my life when I had kids and it was all a little bit too hard to work for free all the time. But you'll know when that point comes. But truthfully, most of the most interesting films, particularly at the beginning of your working life, has to be for free. Mm. Because that's the only way that you retain control. Mm. And, and that's the only way that you retain a sense of accuracy. Otherwise, you can give yourself away. I mean, you've got to remember the thing about being paid, and it doesn't matter what field you're in, could be a builder, mm. there's a right price for your labor and there's a wrong price and you can be paid too little and you can be paid too much and if you're paid too much for something the energy can be wrong so be very careful of that you could be uh, an aspiring film maker and you could be offered an obscene amount of money to do a commercial for some dodgy project product and you could think that you can hack it because maybe that money will fund your project. And that is a very honorable tradition, by the way. Every time I see somebody, when I see Iggy Pop doing a like hydroelectric or whatever it was, freezer commercial, I think there's Iggy Pop funding his artistic integrity. I have no problems with that at all because you know that he's gonna be doing something good with that money. Um, and sometimes that's what people need. But if it, if it actually corrodes something in you, if it's bad for your system, or if it means that you lose uh, confidence in your own identity or your own voice. That's not good. So you mm. have to be really attentive. Um, but I think that, you know, there's a tradition called earning money with your left hand. So you earn money, you work in the cafe, you work in the cafe, they work in the cafe and you'll develop your script and you develop your script and you develop your script. That's a real, I, I like that. I'm, I'm going to steal that one off you too. <laughs> I think yeah. that, no, but it's, it's yeah. just real. It's just reality. It's amazing. You're talking about all these good stories with friends and collaborating with friends and, and making projects. Have you ever uh, been in a situation where you haven't shared the same artistic view as somebody on set or maybe the, uh, the relationship hasn't worked the way you wished it to? That's great, 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 great question. Let me think. The answer is yes, but it's very, very, very uh, good low percentage. 
uh, because mm -hmm. as I say, I'm, I'm so dedicated to being with people I feel comfortable with that, you know, very, very occasionally someone has crept in who has been a bit tricky to be around. And the good news is there are all the other people that you can, oh, well, okay, this is what I would say. Yeah. This is what I would say. And this is, this is, um, this is real. I think filmmaking is quite, it's a very vulnerable making business mm. um, for everybody actually, because it's very exposing. You all work in your little worlds and then you come together and it's show and tell. And it's, you know, you have to be a combination of self-sufficient and not gregarious, but able to share and very collectively minded. And some people are able to do that with real grace and humor and they're able to bring their work to a director and a director to say, I don't like that, go away and do it again. If you're, you've made a prop or something, or you've, you've produced a lighting setup, or you, you've produced a reading of a line or something. And you have to take that and you have to humbly go, okay, I'm gonna go back and I feel trusting and I'm gonna figure it out again. Same can be the case for the director. The director can feel put on the spot completely because 500 people are coming to a director every five minutes and saying, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Do you want red or blue? Do you want high or low? And the director has to come up with all these answers. And it's a wise and settled human who can say, do you know what? I don't know yet. Give me a minute. I got to figure it out. Or I don't know. I don't care. You choose. Mm -hmm. Or you've given me red. I want blue and just really have your way. And the thing is that all these relationships are complicated and some people find it really stressful and they act out in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important, and this is probably true if you work in a bank as well, that people have different people have ways different of displaying their shyness. And some people are honest enough and in a way comfortable enough to look as shy as they are but most people hide it and very often they hide it with all manner of nonsense and you know high-handedness and bossiness and egotistical parading around and strutting and i think it is the most compassionate and the most fruitful way when you come upon somebody like that to just remind yourself that nobody who's really happy is going to be behaving like that they can't be. And you just try and dig deep for that compassion and go, they're shy. They're just trying to bully everybody around them into not noticing how shy they are. And find, try and find a way to make them comfortable, to make them feel more able to trust the group they're in mm -hmm. so that they can relax and, and just be cozy. And it doesn't always work. I mean, some people, particularly people who are older and have worked in the business for, for a very long time and have had that kind of behavior really endorsed and, um, and su supported and encouraged in a way, um, you can't crack them. <laughs> but I think when in doubt, go for love. And when in doubt, go for compassion and try and make people as comfortable as they can be and I'm not just talking about the the directors here because of course one's one's task as a director is in a way you're the host of the party so you've got to re try and look after everybody which can be overwhelming by the way um, but everybody you know if you're a performer and you're working with someone who, who you can tell is just acting out because they're scared mm. and there's a lot to be scared about particularly if you're older and you've got a reputation to protect I mean, there's something that happens in, that I, whenever I work in industrial environments, which is not that often, because, you know, I, I can count on the fingers of, I would say, two hands, the properly industrial films I've made. I mean, you kind of mentioned them, Rob, you know, the Narnia film, the, the Marvel film, the, you know, those big, you know, those really big, like, <laughs> juggernauts. Yeah. You have all these huge stars coming in and doing a part here and a part there. And you have these production assistants who are terrified. 
And they're terrified because they've been, well, most of them are terrified. And I don't judge them for that. They're terrified because people are behaving know-how and they're being very demanding and they're, you know, they'll be on the phone when they're being called to the set. And you'll see a production assistant waiting outside because the first assistant had said, go and get so-and-so, we need them, the camera's ready, we need them on set. And there'll be some production assistant waiting outside the caravan. Going, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't interrupt him. He's on the phone. And he kind of knows that he's wasting the time. And there are, if you're on a big film, there are probably thousands of people waiting, waiting for him. And, um, or her. And they, um, I, I always say to production assistants on the big gigs, I say, knock on the door, tell me I'm needed. There's nothing that I'm doing while I'm here that is more important than coming onto the set. So just interrupt me. And I have to really train them over a course of days. I say, listen, interrupt me. This phone call, I'm just, you know, I'm just killing time. The second the camera's ready, you just get me. And I, you know, after a few days, you can feel them relaxing. But I can see but why I can see people continue that kind of noxious behavior because they are enabled and in a way they're encouraged by the all the sort of oh you know kid gloving and they treat you like you're a bloody pasha and yeah so you if you have to make an effort to break down that sort of hierarchy and that nonsense and if you're in that situation if you are a third ad or a fourth and you're going to knock on someone's door to get them to come to set uh yeah it's tricky because you might lose your job. But uh, there are ways of remembering that that's a human being there and the chances are they're just behaving really badly and uh, they need to be reminded why they're there. And it's, it's really, I'm, I'm loving hearing you tell these stories because it's quite interesting because I think um, you're speaking to the film industry like it, or, it's just like any you've brought in that you say like builders or whatever it's just like any industry course, isn't it like anything like anything yeah um, and just ask, go no, on. sorry no no, no go, on, go on go on i was just saying it's just like any industry i was going to move on to sort of the more technical uh, uh questions because you mentioned being on set with directors and i know a lot of the uh the members would find this interesting so when you've you've obviously worked with a number of directors and you mentioned a few what as an actor, do you find works best for you? I know it's different for different actors. What, how, what sort of directors do you find best to work with and how, what sort of approach do they take to getting the best out of you as a, a performer? That's an amazing question because, um, so what kind of, I mean, mm. every artist is completely unique. Every filmmaker is completely unique. There are, um, of course, there are some ways of working that some people share, but mm. everyone is, is really unique. I mean, my first, and it may sound like a glib answer, but nice people, that's the <laughs> kind I like, um, but I'm actually quite serious about that, nice people. Um, but I've worked with, I mean, one of the things that I love about my working life is that I've made it a bit of a kind of emblematic thing of my adventure of life, of working life, uh, to work with, you know, all the nicest and best filmmakers in the world, from mm. Bella Tarr to Wes Anderson to Derek Jarman to Eric Zonka to Sally Potter to Lynn Ramsey to um, Bong Joon-ho to, you know, it's a, it's a rich, rich, rich panoply and they all work completely differently. Um, and I like working differently. I like, you know, for example, I'll give you a couple of examples. Bong Joon-ho, Snowpiercer, who Snowpiercer has never been distributed in this country. And no. some people in the audience will know what I'm talking about. It's a masterpiece and Harvey Weinstein <laughs> didn't, there's a long story, but he as a sort of sulk didn't, uh, distribute it in the UK, but one day it will be distributed and you will see it and it's a masterpiece. Snowpiercer, uh, the, the host and uh, Okja, brilliant, brilliant Korean filmmaker. His new masterpiece is going to be in Cannes this year. He works in a very particular way. He writes, 
incredibly precise screenplays and he works with storyboards. And there are a number of people who do, like the Coen brothers also work with storyboards. So you get up in the morning, you get your sides, your, your and sides are those little, it's like a little bit of the script that you get every day. It's like the portion you're gonna shoot that day. And these filmmakers who work with storyboards also include like a cartoon down the bottom of there's gonna be this shot, and it's gonna be, you know, that. Mm -hmm. And then they'll, they'll, there'll be another frame and it'll be a long shot and I'll be in the background and there'll be a cactus and there'll be a dog. And you go, oh, right, okay, that's interesting. That section of the text is going to be in long shot. And that section of the text is just gonna be my ear. It's really good. I mean, it's one way of working, not the only way of working, by any means, but it's very fascinating to work like that. Um, and I love that. Then there's another way of working, for example, Joanna Hogg, who is my very great friend, whose new film, The Souvenir, is just about to be, well, actually, it, I think it's gonna be in, 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 uh, in uh, the autumn, is gonna be released in this country. Um, it was in Sundance this year. She improvises, she doesn't give you a script. She tells some people, what the story is and other people she doesn't tell at all. This film, The Souvenir, which we just made, very interestingly, my daughter, Honor, who was 19 at the time and had just left school, um, plays the leading character. She doesn't wanna be a performer. She wants to go to university and read uh, neurology and psychology. And she, uh, Joanna did not want an actress and she didn't want somebody who wanted to be an actress. And in this film, there are only two people who have ever been in a film before. Me, I play the mother, and uh, Tom Burke, who plays uh, the lover. And everybody else was what we might call real people. There's a great French filmmaker called Robert Bresson, great classic film, who, again, sorry to be a bit film school, but you've got to know about these people. Robert Bresson worked with real people, didn't work with actors at all. And worked in a similar way to Joanna. So Joanna essentially doesn't write a script. This is actually a very liberating example for you guys because you don't have to write a script that looks like, look at my scripts here. You got the one. <laughs> doesn't have to look like that. It can be a short story. And what you do if you're going to work in that way, if you're Joanna, is you work in sequence, which is a huge luxury and fantastic. You wake up in the morning, and you come to the set and she'll say, okay, so today the scene is gonna be a dinner party and this person, this person, this and that. And if there's somebody who, like for example, shooting the souvenir, um, Honor being the complete novice and also playing a part who what is a novice, she didn't tell anything. So she didn't introduce her to people until she met them in front of the camera. She didn't tell them she didn't tell Honor what was going to be happening at all. So there are a couple of moments in the film, if you see the film, where Honor is given some news that she didn't even know was going to happen in the script. Okay, I'll, that's a whole long Joanna Hogg story. I'll stop it there. But that's another way of working. Then you have Wes Anderson, for example, who I just made another film with him. That's going to be coming out at the end of this year, The French Dispatch. <laughs> now, Wes Anderson, as you know, works sometimes, this is the second time that I've worked with him, I've worked with him four times, but this is the second time when I've worked him with him straight after making an animation film. And he is so self-confessedly OCD. And, you know, when he's making his, when he's making The Isle of Dogs or he's making The Fantastic Mr. Fox, he's literally like... <laughs> and he was like that with us humans i mean no. completely he would say i want you to do it exactly the same but i want this to be like that <laughs> that's how he does it and i'll tell you a, an interesting story about that way of working which might be very useful for performers particularly and i don't think he'd mind me telling you this story because uh yeah because he's a very nice person and he would understand why i'm telling you so I was working with him and I, w I went away for a few days and I came back and this wonderful actor had arrived and he was a brilliant actor and everything I said to everybody, how's the work going? And they said, it's going really slow. And I said, oh, why? I don't know, it's just really going slow. 
So I then saw the actor, who's another very nice person. And I said to him, and he's, he's a brilliant actor. I said to very experienced. And I said to him, uh, how's it going? And he said, it's really slow. I don't know. I think Wes doesn't like me. I don't know why it's going so slowly. And I said, can I ask you, did you come with lots of ideas and tell him all your ideas? And he said, yes, I did. And I said, right, okay. <laughs> Worked with Wes enough times to know that this is not the way this operates. What you need to do with Wes, because he's so precise and he knows exactly, he has done a storyboard. He has not only done a storyboard, but he has voiced, he's made a little sort of mock-up of the film, like a, like a black and white animated uh, feature. And he's voiced the entire film himself. So all the characters, he's a, so he knows exactly how it's got to sound, exactly where the emphasis is, exactly what the performances are. That's why Wes Anderson's films are Wes Anderson's films because he totally molds it. So I said to this actor, this is what you should have done. You should have come in, you should have let him manipulate you to do exactly what he wanted. And then when he was happy, then you say, okay, we've got that. Here's another suggestion. Why don't I do it coming in shouting? Or why don't I do it lying on the floor? And because he will then be happy knowing that he's got in the can all his fantasies, he'll be very open to it. And I took this to Wes and I said, is this true what I just said? And he said, yes, that's exactly right. I have to get out of my system, my fantasy, and then I'm ready to hear what the actor wants. And I think that there'll be some directors in the audience who will know that I'm talking about something that they may like to do. And that's, again, no judgment. If that's the way you must work, you must work that way and you must explain to your performers, listen, there will come a time when I've got what I want in the can where you can play. You can do it in a French accent, you can do it you know, in your underwear and let's have a look. And maybe I'll like it and maybe I'll like it better than what I thought I wanted. And I'm open to that. Uh, but I, I will be unsettled if I don't get what I've been thinking about for months and very often years. So that's another way of working. And that's a very experienced filmmaker admitting that he has this, you know, slightly, he has limits. He needs to get it out. He needs to get it out of his system before he can be open to your uh, input. And uh, yeah, so there you go. And this brilliant, brilliant actor um, was clogging up the works with all his brilliant ideas. Um, <laughs> it's really, I mean, that's, it's really interesting. So we've talked about the director side of things and it's obvious, um, that, well, it, it seems obvious to me the way that you work, it's quite collaborative and you, and, and you listen and you're quite open to ideas. Um, but, in terms of um, approaching a character, I know a lot of our members have asked this. How do you how do you go about approaching a, a, a character before a film? And obviously, you've got scripts there. How do you go about developing how you're going to perform um, for a piece? Well, I know that real proper actors know exactly how to answer this question. Um, and oh, here's somebody. Come up. Come up. Come on. Oh, it's Louis. <laughs> oh, hello, Louis. <laughs> oh, Hi, bless. Louis. I'm missing my dog. Um, I love dogs. Ah, uh, yes, he's one of five. Five. Um, yeah, whole family. Um, they all the same. Or they? They're the same. Fa yeah, they're a grandma. His mother and him, his sister, his aunt, and his nephew. Brilliant. Brilliant. They're very distracting. <laughs> um, yes, I mean I know, and that's I never went to a, a, an acting school. I know that drama schools teach you the stuff how to create a character and i i don't know any of that so i'm i apologize in advance you if you want to know what the sort of techniques are then you must talk to a proper professional <laughs> but what do i do um i need to find something that is like a sort of authentic like a guy rope that can yeah. attach me, whether it's something that's accurate to me, 
or more more often somebody I know very very well and I can I can it's like a stone that I can or or a plant that I, a bulb that I can just plant in the ground and go right that is something I feel very very secure about I really know that uh that element and once that's in the ground then I can relax and I can figure out how they're going to look how they look is very important how they're going to walk how they're going to talk what their voice is is very important and um of course you know depending on who you're working with you know if you're working with someone who's giving you a script like the coen brothers their scripts you don't mess with one word you 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 know at your peril do you put in another word or do a bit of improvisation that is not what they're put on the world in on the earth to do they're put on the earth to write these incredible scripts and you deliver and then you have joanna who with whom joanna hogg with whom you'll develop a character and then you're improvising you're completely free forming and you effectively in joanna hogg's work the performers are effectively the co-writers because or we're writing the dialogue we're coming up with it it's not written we're not learning anything we're just we're writing it as we go along so in order to be that free i always think you just have to be super relaxed so you have to know know the character very very well before you start shooting and that whole period of uh preparation is a is fun is such fun and i always try and make it that i figured it out before we start shooting so that when you start shooting you can just play like child's play um so yeah, very, very practical things like how does this person sound? Um, what do they, how do they look? How do they dress? Very important because when you're working in a film, a 90 minute film, you've, you know, you've got to work fast to give the information about who this person is. So when we're watching a film, we go, oh, that person wears that scarf, that person chooses those shoes, that person carries that cane, and you kind of go, oh, you can figure them out very fast. And that's why costume is so important and uh, details. Why is that that person has chosen those glasses? They went into an optician and they chose those frames. That's very important information. That tells you a lot about a character. All these little details. What was it just you mentioned? Costume? What was your, what was your favorite costume you ever wore on set? God. Oh, I don't know. <gasps> that's tricky. Oh, I can't answer that. Um, I once made a film called Orlando, which uh, is a, again a great a great film. It was the first film that I made in which I was sort of in every frame, and that's a very particular uh, task because when you're in every frame of a film, you really you really affect you 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 drive. You're the motor, really. You're the motor of the whole territory of the film and that film in a, many ways is about costume because the story is based on a book by Virginia Woolf about a young noble man who um, becomes a, a noble woman at a certain point in his life and so it's all about and, and lives for 400 years with immortal in fact, by the way um, and uh, and so the whole thing about what you're wearing you know how you move uh, is, is very much a part of that story um, but I'm not answering your question. What's my what's my favorite? I don't know. Can't answer that question. I gave you a curveball. I was just intrigued. Sorry. Yes. Um, so we, we've just hit one o'clock. Um, do you mind if we go? I've got a few more questions. Just three questions from some of the things. So just have a quick uh, look at them now. Um, Perfect. So, um, right. So Christa, Christopher Buckingham says, "What advice do you give to someone who's got a passion for film industry?" and wants to have it in their life. I know you've covered it a bit at the moment, but uh, that's from Christopher Buckingham. Well, congratulations if you have that passion, Christopher. It's gonna nourish you your entire life. Um, we're all film fans. I mean, one of the things that's wonderful about making films is that nobody who makes films, even the most hardened old, you know, industrial geezer, uh, doesn't love movies, everybody. You know, you've got the art crowd and you've got all those, you know, teamsters on the big films, driving trucks. They're all movie fans. Mm -hmm. So you're in very good company. Um, keep watching. 
I think watch as much film as you can. Again, I never went to film school. You don't have to go to film school to be a filmmaker. You don't have to go to drama school to be a performer. Your film school, and this is, we're very lucky living right now because film is over a hundred years old. We've got a, over a hundred years worth of film to look at and learn from. And we live in the digital age. You can download pretty much everything. Um, and, and then, as I've been saying, ad, ad nauseam, you can make your films so easily. So just keep watching watch as many films as you can, as many different films as you can, even stuff you find boring, watch it, learn from it, ask yourself the question, what am I getting from putting myself in this filmmaker's shoes? And, and just learn and then ask yourself, what films do I want to put out there? I've had the great uh, honor and privilege several times in my life of being on film juries at film festivals yeah, no, and, 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 and I love it. I mean, it's the best thing because you go, you're with a whole bunch of people who are usually pretty great and you watch films for 10 days and then you talk about them and you don't do any press. You're not allowed to and you're treated really well. And, uh, but what I mean to say is that after every single one of those experiences, I've been gagging to make another film. It's always watching films will, will, encourage in you. It's like looking at cookery books or something. It'll make you really hungry. So yeah. look as many films as you can and that will make you, ooh, I would have done that differently. And it'll sort of, it'll tease up your inner voice as a filmmaker. And um, it might mean you want to copy. Fine. I mean, you know, that, that again is a completely honorable tradition. Quentin Tarantino is a self, completely self-confessed thief I was on a jury with him once and we watched some amazing Korean film and he literally afterwards said, oh, I love that scene with the so-and-so. I'm going to steal that and put it in my next film. And he did, like literally. <laughs> so just, you know, acquaint yourself with the world of cinema and that way you will feel the tendrils of your passion becoming very specific. You'll go, ooh, I'd love to do a love story, but I'd like to do it differently. Or I'd love to do a a chase sequence, but I'd like to do it like this. It, uh, brilliant. And, and they've got an interesting question here, actually, from a, a girl for, called Julia. And I think you're the perfect person to answer this, actually, Tilda, because of the way that you've uh, sort of described things and people get on. She said, I'm, I'm 25 and I feel a lot of pressure to do what's expected of someone my age. Continue with a stable job. Don't take too many risks. Plan for the future because filmmaking is unstable and unpredictable. What do you say to people who feel pressurized like this? I've just, she said, I've just quit my um, safe full-time job and, now, and I'm now filmmaking from and Julia. Congratulations, Julia. Oh, well done, love. That is amazing. Well done. That's huge. That's the biggest step. You've done it. First of all, notice the people who are telling you about the unstable world of, of making films. Just ask yourself how many of them are filmmakers. Just, you know, some of them might be. But I bet you, even if they are, they can't be as nourished by it as you will be. It's all about risk. That's what life is. Um, and by the way, this is maybe a radical suggestion. I don't think what I'm talking to you all about is not an unstable world. It's a very stable world. If you put your, if you put your anchor in the stuff that won't let you down, like your real passion. Like that's why, like when I said to Christopher, look at films, that's never gonna end. You know, film make, films are out there, even if everybody stops making films right now, there's a hundred years worth for you to watch. Put your faith in the things that won't let you down. Um, the, 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 the culture of film, your friends, make work with your friends. I'm repeating myself, but it goes on being true. And your passion and just analyze why you love it so much and put faith in that. That is worth everything. You've, you've made the most difficult step. And, and that's completely to be celebrated. And 
there is stability there for you. That's what I'm trying to say. Don't look, you know, there are some places. Okay, how can I put this? I want to give you practical advice here. I mean, I've already said over and over again, stick with your friends. Um, that can be tricky if you're the only person you know who wants to be a filmmaker. And by the way, you'll notice that I, everyone who makes films is a filmmaker. If you're, I'm a filmmaker, you know, people who do props, they're filmmakers. So yes, there are directors, but we are all filmmakers. And find a community of other filmmakers to just keep yourself in, encouraged. Um, I don't know if I'm being practical enough, but I just think there's just, don't believe people who say it's unstable. I mean, mm. you know, what's stable by the way? You know, is it stable to work in the stock market? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, where, where is stability? That's not what life is. Life is, in, life is all about change and it's about instability. And if you're an artist and you are clearly an artist because this passion is strong enough for you to defy all this, I wouldn't call it advice really. It's, uh, yeah, these people obviously care about you and they don't want you to suffer. But it sounds like you were suffering not taking the step. So this is you looking after yourself. Um, it's, it is a stable world. You're right to have faith in it. And uh, don't believe otherwise. It, w it will reward you and it will nourish you. Well Thank done. You. Thank you, Tilda. And, and Tilda, it's, uh, it's just over an hour now and uh, I won't keep you any longer. I just want to say, Tilda Swinton, now, I genuinely, genuinely mean this. You're probably the most wonderful and kindest person I've ever had the pleasure to speak to. Oh, and, Rob. And, no, I genuinely <laughs> It's amazing to be able to, to speak with you, meet Louis, and for you to uh, uh, share your wonderful experience of uh, not a film career, but a passion for doing art uh, over Thank the years. Thank you so much, Rob. It's, it's really my pleasure. I think you can see it. I'm so, I'm, I just want you all to take courage and to know that you're safe, and this is the most wonderful passion. It's a great drug to take, cinema, and you are safe to do it, and uh, it, it, it's got nothing but nourishment nothing in it. But nourishment together. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, I'll say bye then. So thank you so much. You take care. Bye-bye.